When someone mysteriously disappears, we all hope that their family and loved ones find answers. Even decades old cases can be resolved, but sometimes cases that need to be solved never get the pieces needed to conclusively resolve them. Number 5 In 2009, the McLemore family were facing a challenging time. Gracie McLemore was extremely ill with scleroderma and in April, her condition took a turn for the worse. The family was already very close and her mother and daughter, Alyssa, were both caring for her. Alyssa also had a daughter who was a few months shy of her second birthday. On April 9th, Alyssa received a phone call from her grandmother saying Gracie's condition had worsened. Alyssa said she would come home, but she never made it home. Her mother passed away three days later. Alyssa didn't attend the funeral. Her family has no idea where she is. The circumstances surrounding Alyssa's disappearance are extremely creepy. Her family realized the day she vanished that something was wrong and tried to contact authorities, but they were told they needed to wait 24 hours. The following evening, someone made a 911 call from Alyssa's phone. The call only lasted 10 seconds, but the dispatcher heard a woman screaming for help before the line went dead. They were unable to trace the call, but were fairly certain it came up from the Kent area of Washington, where Alyssa lived. Whether the woman calling for help was actually Alyssa was never confirmed, but it was her phone number. In the time between her call from her grandmother and the 911 call, multiple witnesses saw Alyssa near Kent Des Moines Road and Pacific Highway South. It's an area relatively well known to be frequented by prostitutes. The witnesses saw Alyssa talking to a white man between the ages of 50 and 60 in a green pickup truck with an out-of-state license plate. One witness claimed it looked like the two knew each other. Alyssa had been arrested for prostitution in the past, but it seems unlikely this was what she was doing on the day she vanished, as she would have been on her way to see her very sick mother. There have been no further sightings of Alyssa, and her family believes something terrible happened to her. They say she wouldn't have abandoned her family, especially not her daughter, who was with Alyssa's boyfriend and the child's father at the time of Alyssa's disappearance. Authorities believe someone knows what happened to her and are hopeful someone might come forward with information. As the years go on, it seems less and less likely, but there is hope this could someday be explained. Alyssa is described as a biracial African American and Native American woman. She was between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 6 and weighed roughly 360 pounds. She had brown hair, would often dye it blonde and had a scar on her abdomen. Anyone with information should contact the Kent Police Department. Number 4 On March 31st, 2004, Sky Lynn Budnick told her parents she was going to visit a friend who lived nearby. She took her laptop and left the house. It was the last time her family would see her. Skye lived in central Connecticut where she studied Japanese culture at the state university. But when her parents started searching for her four days after she was last seen, they would soon realize Connecticut wasn't the place they were going to get answers. Her parents reported Skye missing on April 4th. After doing this, they were able to access her email where they discovered she had booked a one-way trip to Japan, leaving on April 1st. The unexpected trip out of the country was strange enough, but Skye hadn't packed any clothes with her, hadn't taken a mobile phone, and only had her laptop with her. She had also withdrawn $800 from her bank account shortly before she vanished, but that wouldn't last very long. Skye's family had reasons to fear the worst. She was suffering from mental health problems, including depression. It was a condition that ran in the family but Skye refused to see a doctor about it. She said it was something she needed to deal with on her own, but it didn't appear like her mental health was getting any better. She would often talk about no longer wanting to be alive, 
and said if she saw the cherry blossoms in Japan, she would be able to pass away happily. Her schoolwork wasn't going great either. She would often sleep through morning classes and missed a deadline to apply to study in Japan as part of the university study abroad program. The only reason she was staying at the school was to remain a part of the anime club. Sky had spent much of her teenage years alone. She was extremely shy and didn't make many friends, which only continued after she went to university. The one friend she did have, they fell into an argument the week before Sky vanished. It was this friend that a note was written to. Her family found the note saved in the drafts folder on her email account. It was never sent and there was no information about when the note was written. Even if the note wasn't recent, it's fair to say Sky wasn't in a good frame of mind when she traveled to Japan. Her family followed her over there to try to search for their missing loved one. For about a week after she arrived in Japan, Sky had done typical tourist things like visiting hot springs. The last day she was seen, on April 7th, she was traveling to Sapporo. She was never seen after that. Search teams searched the mountainside for Sky, but turned up nothing. It's possible she's still in the mountains but just hasn't been found. If that's the case, it's possible decades will pass before the mystery is solved. However, there is also a chance Sky is still alive, or at least lived a while longer after she was last seen. The cherry blossoms she wanted to see typically occurred later in the month. It was an event that Sky had mentioned many times, so it's possible she had spent more of the month. Another more helpful theory is that she started her life again in Japan and is figuring things out herself like she said she always would. Sky was 21 years old when she vanished. She had brown hair, blue eyes, and was 5 foot 6. Anyone with information that could help solve this unsolved disappearance should contact the U.S. Consulate in Sapporo, Japan. Number 3 Larisha Walker has been missing for more than 20 years and her disappearance may never be solved. She vanished in a peculiar circumstance on November 19, 1999 after an argument with an unknown person. The day Larisha went missing was mostly normal. She spent time with her family earlier in the day, then dropped her two-year-old son off with her sister. Larisha had an appointment to see a mechanic in Nashville early the following morning, and her sister was watching young Ravon overnight so that she didn't have to wake him up early or take him with her. After dropping her son off, Larisha returned to her home nearby. She called her father between 9.30 and 10 p.m. They chatted for a while and nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. The family grew concerned the following day. Nobody had heard from her and she hadn't come to pick up her son. Her sister, Lakeisha, went to visit her home and found the screen door locked. When she went inside, she found nobody was home but all the lights were on and the stereo was on, playing music at an extremely loud volume. Other than the fact that there was nobody in, there didn't seem to be anything wrong. Lakeisha turned down the volume on the radio, turned off the lights, and left. The following day, there was still no sign of Larisha. Now her family were extremely worried and contacted police. A search of the house found what Lakeisha found. Nothing was out of place. However, they did also discover that the clothes Larisha was wearing earlier that day had been left behind. This confirmed she had come home and she'd gotten changed at some point. It's not known if Larisha's family were able to determine what she changed into. Talking to neighbors also revealed some important information. Larisha had only been living in the apartment for a month or so, and her neighbors didn't know her well enough to intervene when they heard her arguing with someone the night she vanished. No description of the person she was heard arguing with, even whether it sounded like a man or woman, has come to light, nor have any details of when it exactly happened. Along with Larisha, her car was also missing from her home. She drove a 1995 red four-door Oldsmobile, which had a large scratch on the driver's door, and the license plate 419ABG. 
the car, and Larisha have never been found. Tragedy struck years later, when in October of 2016, Larisha's mother also went missing. Wanda Walker had spent years searching for her daughter to no avail. On October 15th, she too disappeared on her way to work. Wanda had stopped partway there after her car had overheated, but her boyfriend came out and put oil in the car. He was able to solve the situation and Wanda went on her way. She never showed up for work and a week later, her car turned up in an alley near her home. There were signs of a struggle and police believe someone may have taken Wanda's life there. Police don't believe the two incidents were connected, but it's possible foul play was responsible for Larisha's creepy disappearance. Number 2 In November of 2002, Joshua Guymond was a junior at St. John's University in Minnesota, where he was studying political sciences. He was known as a high achiever and was involved in extracurricular activities that he hoped would help him achieve his career goals. But on the night of November 9th, he was enjoying himself at a card party at a friend's dorm on campus. Between 11 p.m. and midnight, he left the party to go to the bathroom, but he didn't come back. His friends assumed that he had made the three-minute walk to his own dorm room, which was also on campus. They tried to call his room but got no answer and thought he might have gone straight to bed. The following day, Joshua was supposed to meet with the rest of the mock trial team for practice, but he didn't show up. Nobody was able to get a hold of him. When nobody had heard from him by the following day, his friends contacted authorities and he was reported missing. Unfortunately, John's case quickly went cold. There was no sign he had returned to his apartment on the night of the party, but also no sign of a struggle on campus. It was as if he had disappeared into thin air. There was a lake on campus, and police for a while worked with the belief that he had fallen in the lake while drunk. His friends claimed he wasn't intoxicated when he left the party, but it still would have been possible for him to lose his footing. However, searches of the lakes by both police and private divers have turned up nothing. Joshua's father believes something much darker happened to him. Joshua left behind his glasses and contact lenses, as well as his credit cards. If he had voluntarily disappeared, it would have been strange to do so without his glasses. His father believes he was abducted for unknown reasons, but police found no sign of a struggle on campus. Strangely, not long after Joshua vanished, files were erased from his computer hard drive. Whether this was automatic or done by someone is unknown. Police were able to recover the items and found that some of it was about making fake ID cards. As Joshua's case has been cold for almost 20 years now, it's possible the disappearance may never be solved. But it's also possible someone out there knows what happened that night. Joshua was between 5 foot 10 and 6 feet tall at the time of his disappearance, wearing a hooded sweatshirt and jeans. Anyone with information should contact the Stearns County Sheriff's Department. Number 1 The disappearance of Irena Asher was both extremely strange and extremely sad, and is a case that may never be solved. Irena was a 25-year-old trainee teacher and part-time model who vanished in what was possibly a manic episode in the early hours of October 11, 2004. She was last seen walking towards the ocean on a beach in New Zealand, but her body has never been recovered, something those familiar with the area found very unusual. Irena had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder years earlier but it was a condition she was managing at the time she vanished. A few days before the incident, she had been visiting her family. Her family knew all too well the signs that Irena was approaching another episode. Most notable was how hyperactive she would get. But there was nothing like that leading up to when she vanished. She had, however, recently broken up with her long-term partner and had started a new relationship. It was this new boyfriend who she had been with earlier in the day on October 10th. 
They were at his home with another couple, but Irena started acting strangely. The boyfriend left at her request, but Irena stayed for a while longer. Multiple people came and left the house. At least one person who had visited had been using illegal substances, but it's not known if Irena had taken anything. At 9 p.m. that evening, she contacted police and said she felt unsafe and was being pressured into doing things she didn't want to do. But police didn't think this required them to make sure she was okay, and they instead sent a taxi to bring her home. The taxi ended up going to the wrong address, and Irena fled the house, wearing only Ugg boots, underwear, and a sweater. Irena was next found by Julia Woodhouse and her teenage son, who were driving home. Julia was concerned about the woman and invited her back to the lodge that she ran with her partner. Irena agreed and went back with them. Julia was under the impression that Irena may have been coming down from an illegal substance, and she seemed to be in some mental distress. When police were mentioned, Irena asked for them to not be called, and Julia agreed. She and her partner helped get Irena cleaned up and gave her a dressing gown to keep warm. They agreed to take her home in the morning. But just after 1 a.m., when everyone else had gone to bed, Irena fled from the house. The couple went after her to make sure she was okay, but found the discarded dressing gown. She was next seen about a half hour later by two men walking their dogs. She was naked as far as they could see and stood under a street light near the beach. She seemed to be talking to someone, then bent down and kissed the ground. Irena ran towards the sea and the two men lost track of her. Even with a flashlight, it was too late to see where she had gone, and they figured she had likely gone skinny dipping. Julia called police after Irena fled from the lodge and a search effort got underway that night. The effort focused on the beach where she was last seen which was particularly rough that night, but in a way that made it more likely that someone would have been washed ashore rather than taken out to sea. Nobody ever showed up, though an inquest found that she had likely lost her life in the water. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.